So, hey, I'm Brandon. Thanks for coming. I am very happy to be up in Calgary. Um, one of my very first conventions that I attended was in Canada. Um, it was actually the World Fantasy Convention over in Montreal. I don't know if you claim those people over there, um, but uh, I went over there, and that's actually where I met Moshe Fader, who became my editor and bought my very first book. So um, Canadian conventions are very special to me. Uh, it, was, it was a wonderful story. We, um, we spent the entire convention hunting this guy, Moshe Fader, because um, getting published is hard. Um, many of you, I assume, are writers. That's why you're at this convention. And it, 10 years ago, it was hard. Now it seems like it's both harder and easier because you have the whole self-publishing thing, but that, um, that open, opens more opportunities. So there seem to be more opportunities, but there's so much more work to do that doing it can be harder. But back then, the self-publishing was not nearly as viable as an option. And we were all hunting this guy, Moshe Fader. Um, we had been going to conventions repeatedly, and I say to, um, to people who want to break in, um, particularly in science fiction and fantasy, that uh, one of the best ways to do it is to become part of the community. That means start learning the names of the editors at the various publishing houses. Don't just be submitting your submissions to, you know, Dear Acquisitions Editor, right? If you can go to Tor and say, Dear Claire Eddy, Dear Moshe Fader, Dear Patrick Nielsen Hayden, um, to a specific person, and then say to them, I met you at this convention, or I saw you on this panel, and the things you said really connected with me, or I read four of your authors, and I think they're all awesome. You obviously have very good editorial taste. I specifically chose to send my manuscript to you because of... X, Y, or Z, one of these reasons, you're just going to have a leg up, right? I mean, the best leg up you can have is to say, hey, I've published a bunch of books and they sold a ton, but, you know, <laughs> that's, uh, <laughs> that's um, perhaps not as, um, as easy to do as to say. Um, but you can say, I read your blog and I loved your essay about such and such thing. Now, be truthful Send, this allows you, though, to send to those editors that you think have an editorial style and um, a vision that matches your own. Um, very smart way to go about it. It's a little bit harder in teen, those of you who are publish, uh, want to publish in teen, um, because the teen agents and editors are a little less accessible. Um, they, um, they, the, the science fiction fantasy community has a very open door um, policy. Lots of it's, it's much easier to submit unaged submissions, and they all go to these conventions and all have parties um, and mingle. And the the YA group they they're still very friendly, but the the conventions tend to be a lot more structured, a bit more expensive to get into and things. But you can still do it there. Um, I don't know the other genres nearly as well as I know those two. Um, but anyway, we went to this convention. We um, talked to somebody and said, hey, are there any new editors here, um, editors that are newer that are acquiring um, and are kind of hungry for authors? And one of our contacts said, yeah, Moshe, he just got the green light to start buying stuff. And so we spent the whole con searching for him in Montreal um, and eventually found him at a party on Sunday night at like 1 a.m. Um, and we went and talked to him, and the thing about editors is they'll talk forever, like authors will, as long as you ask the right questions. We didn't say, will you buy our books? We said, what are you working on? And he started talking about all these books he was working on and how excited he was about them. And um, that he was, liked books like we liked. Um, and so Dan and I both sent him books, and he eventually bought a book from me and a book from Dan and launched both of our careers. Um, so it happens. It does still happen. Um, let me um, go ahead and transition into a short reading. I like to run these things doing readings. Um, I'm going to do a little reading for you from uh, Shadows of Self, which is the sequel to Alloy of Law, which is a Mistborn novel. Um, now, Mistborn is very different in that once I sold Moshe Elantris, um, that was the book I sent to him. It was my sixth novel. Um, and he, it sat on his desk, by the way, for 18 months. Um, he took a long time getting to that book. It was uh, 250,000 words long, which is short for me these days, but very long for an unpublished writer. And he, he kept 
saying, he, he, he told me later, I was like, I kept looking at it and thinking, oh, I should just reject this. I'm never going to get to it. But then he thought, but he was such a nice young guy. He's, that, nice, um, that, that nice boy, I should read his book. Um, yeah. How was, was I at this time? I was 28 or 27, 27, 28, somewhere around there. Um, I think this was the World Fantasy Convention in 2001. Um, and I was born in 75, so I guess 26. Is that math right? Yeah. Um, so I was 26. Um, and so he, was, he, he called back 18 months later, um, so I would have been 27 or 28. Um, and he, um, he kept thinking, yeah, but boy's so nice. And so he sat down 18 months later and finally said, well, I better read some of this thing. He started reading it, and then he couldn't stop. And then overnight, he read like a quarter of the book and then called me the next morning um, and said, it's been 18 months. I don't know if you sold this to anyone else, but if you haven't, I want to buy it. Um, and it's that call that you love to receive, right? You guys, many of you heard my phone call, uh, my, my story about picking up the phone um, and getting a voicemail from Harriet. This was actually, I got a voicemail as well um, because, you know, I get up late. And so I listen to this voicemail. It says, hi, I, I, I don't know if you remember me. This is Moshe Fader. Uh, you sent me a book 18 months ago. Um, if this is the right Brandon Sanderson, because he had to Google me to find my new phone number, then I want to buy your book. Um, so that's a nice voicemail to receive. Uh, um, called him back, and we talked about what to do, because he didn't want to just buy one book. He wanted to buy multiples. And um, I told him, I sent him Way of Kings, and that terrified him. <laughs> it was big. It was part of something very large. He called me back, and I still remember this phone call. He was like, can, can we split this? <laughs> Is there any way that we can get this into, like, seven books? Um, and I said, no, but Way of Kings isn't right, ready yet. I've got something else to pitch to you. And I pitched him the Mistborn series, which I pitched as a trilogy of trilogies, um, an epic fantasy trilogy. Um, and then I wanted to do something I hadn't seen done in epic fantasy, which is I wanted to transition that same world into an urban fantasy series, um, where the... Epic fantasy trilogy, what had happened in that became the foundation for mythology and religion in a contemporary society. So it's an urban fantasy in a secondary world. And then do a third trilogy set in the future and write a space opera in which the magic system, which has run through all three of them, becomes the means by which space travel is possible. Um, and, you know, one of these things I had never seen done before. And if I haven't seen it done before, I, I tend to want to do it. Well, I wrote the original trilogy, um, and then I started working on the Stormlight Archive, and I came to the realization I did not want to be releasing um, two series at once that were really in-depth and involved. Um, I wanted, if I were going to be releasing what, something as in-depth as the Stormlight Archive, which will have a large cast, uh, very you know, continuity-laden, I wanted everything else I was doing to be shorter and to be more episodic. Right? Things like Steelheart or whatnot that you can read, get a complete story, um, and then when the sequel comes out, you can refresh yourself very quickly rather than you know, spending a lot of time digging back into it to get yourself back up to speed. And this comes from my love of the Wheel of Time, where kind of when I was following the Wheel of Time, it was hard to follow other series of that magnitude because Wheel of Time was so involved, so in-depth, that, you know, when a new book would come out, I'm like, all right, I've got to reread the whole series that takes, like, a big chunk of my time. I need the other things I'm reading to take less chunks of my time. Um, and so I wanted to do more Mistborn books, but I did not want to start the second trilogy yet, which was going to be very involved. And so I did something called Alloy, called Alloy of Law, which was uh, a kind of halfway step. It's like trilogy 1.5 right, um, which was uh, set in an early 1900s. Um, my pitch to myself was early 19, 1910 New York uh, with the magic having come, um, come up through and kind of the responses to the epic fantasy trilogy, but now getting to contemporary, but not quite there yet, modernist. And uh, the reception to that was very good. People seemed to enjoy it. And so I wrote a um, chunk of a second one, which I'm um, still working on, and we plan to be releasing as my, my next um, adult book. So it should be next year sometime um, with the, the third Stormlight Archive the year after. I'm going to do Stormlight Archive books every two years um, because they're just so involved that it takes a long time to get one of those done. Um, and so this is called Shadows of Self, um, and 
If you haven't read the first one, that's okay, um, because like I said, I intend these to be a little more, um, a little more standalone-ish. Here we go. I figure I should write one of these things, the book read, to tell my side, not the side the historians will tell for me. I doubt they get it right, and I don't know that I'd like them to anyhow. Wax tapped the book with the end of his pencil, then scribbled down a note to himself on a separate page. I'm thinking of inviting the Boris brothers to the wedding, Steris said from the couch opposite the one Wax sat upon. He grunted, still reading. I know Says doesn't approve of what I've done, the book continued, but what did he expect me to do, knowing what I know? The Boris brothers, Steris continued, they're acquaintances of yours, aren't they? I shot their father, Wax said, not looking up. Twice. I couldn't let it die, the book read. Hemalurgy is good now, I figure, right? Are they likely to try to kill you? Steris asked. Boris Jr. swore to drink my blood, Wax said. Boris III, and yes, he's the brother of Boris Jr., don't ask. He swore to, what was it, eat my toes? He's not a clever man. We can use it, the book read. We should, shouldn't we? I'll just put them on the list then. Steris said. Wax sighed, looking up from the book. You're going to invite my mortal enemies to our wedding? We have to invite someone, Steris said. She sat with her blonde hair up in a bun, her stacks of pa papers for the wedding arrangements settled around her like subjects at court. Her blue flowered dress was fashionable without being the least bit daring, and her prim hat clung to her hair so tightly it might as well have been nailed in place. I'm certain there are better choices for invitations than people who want me dead, Wax said. I hear family members are traditional. As a point of fact, I believe your remaining family members actually do want you dead. She had him there. Well, yours don't, not that I've heard anyway. If you need to fill out the wedding party, invite more of them. I have invited all of my acquaintances as would be proper, Stara said. And uh, um, all my family as would be proper, Stara said. And all of my acquaintances that merit the regard. She reached to the side, taking out a sheet of paper. You, however, have given me only two names of people to invite, Wayne and a woman named Renette, who, you noted, probably wouldn't try to shoot you at your own wedding. Very unlikely, Wax agreed. She hasn't tried to kill me in years, not seriously, at least. Steris sighed, setting the sheet beside her. Steris, Wax said. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to be flippant. Renette will be fine. We joke about her, but she's a good friend. She won't ruin the wedding, I promise. Then who will? Excuse me? I've known you for the better part of a year now, Lord Waxillium, Steris said. I can accept you for who you are, but I am under no illusions. Something will happen at our wedding. A villain will burst in, guns firing, or we'll discover explosives in the altar, or perhaps the priest will try to assassinate you. It will happen. I'm merely trying to prepare for it. <coughs> You're serious, aren't you? Wax asked, smiling. You're actually thinking of inviting one of my enemies so you can plan for a disruption. I've sorted them by threat level and ease of access, Steris said, <laughs> shuffling through her papers. Wait, Wax said, rising and walking over. He leaned down next to her, looking over her shoulder at the pages. Each sheet contained a detailed biography. Ape Manton, the Dasher Boys, Rusks, Rus Rusts, Rick Stranger. I'd forgotten about him. Where did you get these? Your exploits are a matter of public record, Steris said, one that is of increasing interest to people. How long did you spend on this? Wax asked, flipping through the pages in the stack. I wanted to be thorough. This sort of thing helps me think, and besides, I wanted to know what you had spent your life doing. That was actually kind of sweet in a bizarre, Steris sort of way. Invite Douglas Venture, he said. He's kind of a friend, but he can't hold his liquor. You can count on him making a disturbance at the after party. Excellent. And the other 37 seats in your section? Invite the leaders among the seamstresses and dock workers of my house, Wax said, and the captains of the constable watches of the various octants. It'll be a nice gesture. Very well. If you want me to help more with the wedding planning, no, this is the perfect sort of thing to occupy me, though someday I would like to know what is in that little book you peruse so often. I. The front door to the mansion slammed open down below and booted feet thumped up the steps. A moment later, the door to the study burst open and Wayne all but tumbled in. Darience, the house butler, stood apologetically just behind. 
Wiry and of medium height, Wayne had a round, clean-shaven face, and, as usual, wore his old rough, Ruff's clothing, though Steris had appoint- pointedly sent him new clothes on at least three separate occasions. Wayne, Wax said, you could try the doorbell sometime. Nah, that warns the butler. <laughs> Which is kind of the point. Beady little buggers, Wayne said, shutting the door on Darien's. Can't trust them. Look, Wax, we've got to go. The marksman has made his move. Finally, Wax thought. Let me grab my coat. Wayne nodded, glancing towards Steris. Hello, crazy, he said to her. Hello, idiot, she said, <laughs> nodding back. Wayne, uh, Wax buckled on his gun belt over his fine city suit with vest and cravat, then threw on his duster. Let's go, he said, checking his ammo. Wayne pushed his way out the door, barreling down the stairs. Wax paused beside Steris' couch. I... A man must have his hobbies, she said, raising another sheet of paper and inspecting it. I accept yours, Lord Waxillium, but do try to avoid being shot in the face, as we have wedding portraits to sit for this evening. (laughs) I'll remember that. Keep an eye on my sister out there, Steris said. This is a dangerous chase, Wax replied, hastening to the door. I doubt Morrissey will be involved. If you think that, then your powers of investigation are suspect. It's a dangerous chase, so she'll find a way to be involved. Wax paused by the door. He glanced back at Steris, and she looked up, meeting his eyes. It felt as if there should be more at their parting, a send-off of some sort. Fondness? Steris seemed to sense it too, but neither said anything. Wax tapped his head, tipped his head back, taking a shot of whiskey and metal flakes, then charged through the doorway and threw himself over the balcony railing. He slowed himself with a push on the silver inlays of the marble floor of the entryway, hitting with a thump of boots on stone. Darian's opened the front door for him as he leapt out to join Wayne at the coach for the ride to... Wax froze on the steps down to the street. What the hell is that? Motor car, Wayne said from the backseat of the vehicle. There you go. Yes, if you read the first one, the thought of Wayne and a motor car together should terrify you. Um, So, let's do some questions. Throw at me anything you want to know, and I will blab about it for a while. Yes, back here. What did it feel like after I'd met everybody, heard their response and things like this um, regarding the Wheel of Time? Well, I can break that into several different stages. Uh, The first stage was before the book was out, the first one, right? Um, And in this case, the Wheel of Time fandom actually embraced me. um, Quite easily, but there was an edge to that embracing. It was always uh, like the emails I got during the time were things like, we're in your corner, but if you screw this up, we're going to murder you, (laughs) right? Um, and it was like, it was like the little PS sub note, uh, you know, footnote at the bottom with a smiley face, but that's a creepy smiley face, right? <laughs> um, the first event I did um, with Wheel of Time fans was at Dragon Con, which Dragon Con in Atlanta had a Wheel of Time track dedicated to it. And so it was kind of the Wheel of Time convention before that same track split off and became its own con, now called Jordan Con, which is also in Atlanta. And so this w- these were the hardcore. Um, and I showed up, and there was a, an enormous room full of them, like, you know, maybe four times as large as this or more, and me in the front, and I'm like... I am going to pronounce all the names in the Wheel of Time wrong, and they are going to lynch me. (laughs) Um, That was my immediate first thought, because, you know, you grow up reading these books, you don't pronounce them the right way. I mean, come on. Um, You just kind of have these names in your head um, that, you know, they were. And um, I sat at this thing thinking, "Eh, I don't know how this is going to go, but they, they, they embraced me. They were very kind to me. They were very good to me. Um, they wanted their book finished, and they knew I was their best shot at it. Um, and then the, the first book came out, and you could hear like a collective sigh of relief throughout all of fandom. Um, touring for that, be- that, that book, I could actually see it stop by stop, because when the first stop, nobody had read it yet. Um, And, you know, the first few stops, there weren't as many people at the signing because they're all, like, reading the book, and they weren't sure if they wanted to see me yet because if they hated it, they didn't want to, like, have the book signed and things like that. And then 
as the the tour continued, the signings got bigger and bigger and bigger um, until by the end they were pretty enormous, which is the reverse of what you expect on a tour. Usually your biggest crowds are at the beginning, and then they trickle off um, as you go through the uh, through the the tour because everyone already has their books and they aren't sure they want to come. You know, they're, they're, getting science fiction fans out of their basements to stores is sometimes a little bit harder. Um, but yeah, so the, it was it was it was a wonderful response in general. Everyone liked the book, um, even the things that they thought I got wrong. They were kind of polite about and said, "Hey, you may want to look at this and things like that." There were, of course, you know, your your fraction of a one percent who were like, "It's time to murder him." Um, but in general, the response was very good. Um, and during that tour, it's very interesting. Um, when I was handed the Wheel of Time by Harriet, um, she gave it to me and then basically said, I need to go grieve now, right? Um, take this. She is an editor. She's not a writer. And so my job was to write the thing, and then she could help me fix it, what I got wrong. But she was not heavily involved in the actual writing process, um, on that book, particularly because she was much more involved in the other two during the writing, um, but it was because she was grieving. Um, you know, you lose some, you, you lose your husband. Um, they say it takes like um, it takes over a year to kind of. You're not supposed to even make any big decisions for a year and things like that. Um, and so I was kind of got this and was kind of alone with it. And then on tour, I became the face for the series, which was very, very kind of bizarre for me because um, I, I had. On one hand, when I first was invited to do this, I was thinking it would be like writing a Star Trek book or something like that, right? There are a lot of people who do that, that step in and do their best and write a tie-in book. Um, That's not how this went. I got given the entire project, the whole creative control, um, with, you know, of course, Harriet, as the editor, having complete veto power. If she decided she didn't want something, it didn't happen. But in the writing process, it was basically anything you want to do, do it. Write the books the way you need to. And then on tour, it was, it was basically all the fans said, you're our dad now. <laughs> um, and so we want to ask you all the things that we used to ask dad. Um, and that was sometimes very hard because I was not um, as, as entrenched in the Wheel of Time my, fandom minutia as I can be like in my own books and things. Um, And so they would ask these really detailed questions about like book four. And I'm like, Raffo? Um, (laughs) Which means read and find out, but that's what Robert Jordan said. But I was just saying because I have no idea what you're talking about. Um, Or I I, I started to turn those into what I called Maffos, which is Maria was Robert Jordan's assistant. I said, go ask her because she will know. I have no clue. Um, But they they really embraced me and it, it was odd to kind of step into that and basically be the face and have the creative control of the entire project, which is not what I was expecting at all when I, when I took this on, but I kind of had to step up and become the blogger for the Wheel of Time, um, the, the face for the project, and the, the person in, in charge. Um, and it, boy, it taught me a lot. Um, and uh, yeah, it was a fantastic experience, but it was more than I had, had expected that I would be doing on these. When someone writes a Halo book, they don't take over for Halo, right? Um, And that's really what was different for this project, um, was doing that. All right, right here. Why? Okay, don't give spoilers. No spoilers. But why did I end the trilogy as I did? Um, The reason that I I end anything is I feel that it's the right ending. Um, I am a planner. I like to outline, and oftentimes what I'll do is, uh, and I did this with the Mistborn trilogy, is I will outline the first book in detail and then have a few paragraphs about the sequels, and then I will write the first book. And once I know the characters well enough and I, I have a feel for the um, book, because often you'll be knocking down lots of walls um, in your outline and rebuilding them as you write a book, then I went and I outlined the rest of the series with confidence, now knowing that I knew the characters really well and did those outlines and then wrote them. Um, and any time that, um, that I, I don't think of myself like if a character dies in one of my books, I don't think of myself as killing them off. I think of letting them take the risks that their personality as a character demands that I let them take and then having fitting that into the narrative and um, sometimes I pull the punches and sometimes I don't and it just depends on what I feel is right for the story that I'm trying to tell um, and whether I feel that that character story has been told completely or not Um, where I will sometimes say you know what I'm going to soften this so the character um, you know can return from this is um, I will make the decision based on is their story told 
um, have they, have they have, you know, does that make sense? I don't know if I, I can get it across any way other than that. Um, so that's why I just choose, and I always like my endings to feel like um, I said in the, the last panel, promises and fulfilling those promises. And usually you want to fulfill them in unexpected yet satisfying ways. Um, but you can imagine it just like you know, taking a, a ball and hucking it and watching it go through the air, you need to catch that ball. And at the beginning, certain tones and themes of a book are what create that pass. And catching it means fulfilling on those tones and themes you promised in the first third or quarter of the book. All right, right here. Do you think you're being brave in sending 350,000 words as your first submission? Uh, was I being brave in sending? It was actually 250,000. So not quite as bad, but they say that the, the, the average book um, that editors are looking for tends to be, um, depending on genre, eighty to 90,000 for most genres, with epic fantasy going up to 120, um, is what you usually hear. Um, so it was twice the length. Um, was I being brave? No, I was being true to the book that I felt it needed to be. Um, I always tell people, every book that you submit is going to have a few mar- red marks against it. You can't get away from that because every book has to take some chances and be daring. If you create the perfect book that hits all the things that you're supposed to do, it will actually be bland. It's not going to, it's not going to be, you know, your, your book is not going to be what you want it to be. Usually maybe there is, you know, the magical book that is the perfect book you want to write happens to hit all of those. Um, but you're going to have to take a few chances, whether it's chances with viewpoint, um, whether it's chances with character. Um, you, know, you're, you have a character that is well outside the mainstream, um, or whether it be length. Whatever it is, your book is going to take some chances that there, a certain amount of the population will immediately give it kind of the red X as soon as they, they see it. But your job is to overcome that, because you already have a red X. Most editors that I've talked to, um, they're going into a book looking to reject it. Why is this? Because they have a stack of 50 of them they know they need to get through. And it's way easier if the, they can pick up a book and be like, oh, I know this one isn't that great. Um, and they can work their way through it faster to find the gems. And you authors might be saying, that's not fair. Well, of course it's not fair. But at the same time, think about two people going up on a stage and starting to play piano. Um, and think about one of them having practiced for three or four months and one of them being a 30-year master of the piano. How long will it tell you to t- to figure, uh, for you to figure out which is which? How fast? You're going to know like that, which one is which. Um, now, it's going to be a little bit harder with fiction because most of you aren't three-monthers. Most of you have been writing for longer than that. But most good editors can tell from a few pages. Um, and if you went to the thing yesterday, you can see that uh, one page it often isn't enough uh, for us if you went to like the, the flash uh, editing. But sometimes it was. Often it wasn't. Usually for me, I will need um, a chapter. I'm not a professional editor. I'm, I, I'm a professor, but I'm not a professional. I can tell you know, what a person's doing right and wrong. You give me a chapter. Um, and so you can take 15 minutes on a submission like this and know pretty quickly whether this person has the fundamental skills in order to tell a story. Um, and my editor always told me, he said, you know, he offered on Elantris before finishing it. And I'm like, you sure you don't want to read the ending first? And he said, you can fix an ending. That's, that's easy. You can't fix fundamental writing skill. Well, you can, but it takes 10 years of practice. Um, an editor can't fix that. An editor can fix um, where you, as a writer, are having problems telling the story you want to tell or where you have a character that's just not quite clicking. Um, these things that an editor can do. So anyway, um, the editor, you already have that red X against you that they want to reject um, and move through this slush pile as quickly. And you're going to have a few others. Your book is too long, another red X. But if they, when they start picking that up, that, when they pick that up and start reading, you want to convince them in those first five pages that you have those fundamentals. And if you do that, you're going to get past 90% of people submitting. Generally, that's what they say. Um, a lot of editors I've talked to, Miss Snark, who used to run a blog, who was an agent, um, broke down her submission, her acceptance policy, and she said out of um, you know, the sample uh, chapters that people would send, she would take one out of ten. Um, so she could read a chapter, and one out of ten of those she would know have the basic fundamentals. You're getting ahead of 90% of the people if you can do that. Now, after that, 
it's, you know, then the, the, uh, the, that's where the, the hard work starts because the editor has to read much further, basically read the whole book and see if this book, if the, those fundamentals turn into a book that is engaging along the long term. Because just because you can write a great paragraph or a great uh, chapter doesn't mean that you can plot an arc across an entire book and things like that. And there may be just too much work required. Um, and by the way, editors, I found, are not looking for a perfect book, they ask themselves, how much work will it take from me to make this book publishable? That's what they're looking for. And they're trying to gauge ones that are in the medium amount um, of, of work taken. And so, yeah, uh, was it brave? No, no more brave than any other um, person who's submitting a book that is going to have a few natural check or X's against it. Every one of us is going to do that. You're not going to follow all the rules. All right, right here. Are there going to be more physical copies of Legion? Yes, there will. Um, what I'm planning to do is maybe do a, um, a, two, a collection of the first two or something like that once the second one comes out. Uh, we may just... The thing is, it's 17,000 words, and at that length, um, it, it costs... It doesn't cost much less to print a 17,000-word book than it does to co- print, like, a you know 200,000-word book. Um, and so that's why when novellas are such a hard... Um, length to print in stores because, you know, you charge 18 bucks for something that's 100 pages when people are like, I can buy a 400-page book for 25 bucks. Why, you know? Um, and so it makes it a hard length. It's a great length for e-books because you can charge a couple bucks for it um, and it can be cost uh, to, you know, to, by, per word, it can be effective. But printing is just the shipping and all of that is the biggest part of the printing exp- expenses. So, um, yes, we're going to do it, but I want it to be of a reasonable cost, which means I probably want to put a couple of them in there. Um, so we'll see what happens. Right now, if you really want to get it, uh, Book Depository ships worldwide. is a UK um, publisher, and they ha- sell a trade paperback and a hardcover of Legion and Emperor Soul together bound in a very handsome edition. Um, I really like it. Very nice cover. Um, I highly recommend that edition to you if you want a Legion and you don't already have Emperor's Soul. Um, they're the, the two best short pieces I've ever done, and they're collected together in one. Um, I, w- I would say, and it's free shipping, so it's, it'll cost you, you know, it, it'll co- still cost you like 20 bucks, um, but you'll get both of them. Um, so that, that's where I go. All right, right here. I actually have a question about your Alcatraz. Yes. Uh, are the Alcatraz books ever going to become accessible? These are my middle grade series, Alcatraz versus the Evil Librarians. Tor bought the rights. They're starting publishing them again next year, I believe. And there will be one every quarter until we reach the fifth one, which I have written, which will, um, which will finally end Alcatraz's story. So they, they, are, they are done. Yes. So we're right here. Um, can you talk about your writing routine? Use. Okay, yeah, my, my, my writing, what, what tools do I use and what I do? So what I do is um, when I'm starting a book, I, I just use Microsoft Word for most everything. I open up a file, and it's my book guide, and I write plot, setting, character. Um, and these three headings, and I use the document map in Microsoft Word to create an auto outline. I, I like the document map a lot. And so I will then write under these things the ideas I've already had because I don't start a book without having thought about it for usually years. Um, and a book for me is not one idea. A book becomes when multiple ideas come together and do interesting things to one another. Uh, the, the example I like to use for this is Mistborn, right? I actually wrote a book called Mistborn that had that magic system in it, but the book was not very good. This is in my unpublished days. I wrote another book called Final Empire, which had um, a lot of the, the backstory you know, the, 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 the idea of the, the Dark Lord who, um, uh, who won, right? The hero failed. That was the backstory for that. And neither of those books worked. Um, they didn't have enough to them. Um, I had had this idea of, you know, what happens if the Dark Lord wins. I've been, you know, reading a Harry Potter book, I actually think, and thinking, man, this poor, this poor Voldemort, these poor Dark Lords, they always get the raw end of the deal. Some stupid kid kills them, right? Um, <laughs> Yeah, what happens if, you know, Frodo gets the end of Lord of the Rings and um, Sauron says, oh, my ring, thank you, I've been looking for that, right? Um, And killed him and took over the world. What would happen then? And that idea was in there. I tried writing a book just on that idea, and it wasn't enough. 
Um, separately, I had the idea of, hey, I really like heist novels. Um, I like, you know, things like Sneakers, the movie. If you haven't seen that, it's a fantastic movie. And they've been hitting a resurgence in films lately because you'd seen The Italian Job and Ocean's Eleven and things. And, um, and then Inception was going to come later, which is also a heist film. Um, and these sorts of things, there was, there was a lot of interest in them, and I, I really love this genre. I'm like, why don't I do a fantasy heist story where everyone in the team has a different magical talent? Um, and that'll be really cool. Um, and these ideas alone weren't enough to make a story. But when I combined them and said, wow, this, is, this world, the hero failed a thousand years later. The, uh, the heist is that these people try to rob the Dark Lord um, because they want to overthrow the empire and they also want to get rich. And so it's like, we'll do this our way. Um, and they, you know, they bribe his armies away from him. that sort of plot. Worked really well with the two ideas smashing together. So I've created this plot outline, and, or this, this book guide, and I write down all the ideas that have been smashing together and I see where my holes are. I'm like, all right, you know, I have plot hooks. Um, I have setting hooks, but I don't have, you know, this, this plot that I'm building, I'm going to need to have an interesting religion because religion is important to the characters and the plot. So there's a hole there. I'm going to have to design that to fill this hole. And I look where the holes are. I'm like, oh, I've come up with a great lead character uh, for Mistborn. It was Kelsier. Kelsier, I had already I des- designed. He was working really well, but I'm like, Kelsier can't carry this story on his own. Um, this is a heist story, and a lot of heist stories, I, I think I want to put in... Um, you know, an apprentice character because everyone in the, uh, in the team will already know each other and everything will be so established that it, I think it'll feel stale unless there's someone in there learning all of this and giving us kind of an excuse to learn and to see the different thieving crew roles and whatnot. So I'm like, I need a new character. And so Vin was a hole. There's a hole right there for a character that's going to be a main lead. Um, and so I, I build all of this out. I'd identify my holes and I brainstorm my holes. And then my outline becomes a series of bullet points of promises of small plot arcs, like here's a mystery plot. This is the mystery that's getting discovered. Here are the points along the path that will work toward the, um, the, the resolution, and here's the cool resolution. Here's a relationship plot. Here are the steps along the way that will make that one work. Um, and here's the, the resolution. And I build all of these little plots and things out. Characters are, you know, what are they passionate about? What do they look like? Who are they? They're, those are the most vague because I usually have to start writing before I can really figure out a character. I discovery right character. And then setting is the biggest one. I usually have a lot on my setting because I like to have my setting really down before I start writing. Um, and then I start writing. Um, I use a, a software called WikidPad, which is spelled WikiDPad. As a, it's an open source wiki software. I use that for keeping all of my world building notes. Um, once I'm done with the book guide, I transition them all into there, and it's uh, you know thousands and thousands of pages of Cosmere world building notes um, about about various things. So, um, and that is kept only on uh, locally. You can't go find that online. Um, uh, so, and that's how my process goes. And I write every day. I sit down and say, okay, this next chapter. What are the bullet points? What are the things I want to achieve? And let's build a scene out of these uh, these goals and objectives, and go forward. Um, my goal is 3,000. Um, I'm usually pretty close, though it's usually between two and 3,000. Um, I'm not actually a, a particularly fast writer. Um, that's about 500 words an hour, um, writing around um, six to eight hours a day, um, and then doing like email and stuff for another couple hours. So I don't, I don't write fast. I write consistently. I write basically every day. All right, let's go right here. Yes, um, though less and less. Um, these days, I don't have a lot of time for my teaching anymore. Um, these days, I, um, I teach one class once a year, an evening class, so one night a week. Yeah, and it's, it's a university course, so the real teachers in here who teach, you know, like high school and stuff are like, oh, that would be easy. Um, yeah, it's like I'm like the, the least professorly someone can be and still kind of claim the title, so Yeah. Yeah, I don't have a lot of time for that anymore. I used to teach like freshman comp and things like that. When the writing career took off, um, the, the, I didn't have to teach anymore. I actually even donate my salary back to the local the science fiction magazine on campus. I pay for their science fiction magazine. I was editor there for many years, and so that's where their funding comes from. So I just teach my class and do it for fun. So let's go right here. Uh, when I started doing what? 
Oh, multiple books. Uh, when did I start doing multiple books? So I have always been pretty hardcore about this whole writing thing ever since I decided I wanted to do it, which I decided, um, actually, it's kind of an interesting story. I went to college my freshman year as a chemistry major um, because my mother had convinced me that authors don't make any money. She's an accountant. She really wanted a doctor. She tried so hard. Every one of her kids, she kind of had start off on that route, and then we all shot somewhere else. Um, um, but uh, she's a great woman. But, you know, she, she, she believed in careers that were very, on, the, on paper, made a lot of sense. And writing didn't make a lot of sense on paper. Uh, so she's like, chemistry major. Chemistry majors get, uh, get scholarships. English majors don't. Uh, this is what she convinced me. So I went to school freshman year, and I was misplaced in chemistry. Though I have a love for the sciences, if you can't tell from my writing. Uh, um, but sitting and doing math all day was just not fun for me. It wasn't that I was bad at it. I was just fine at it. But I hated the busy work. I dreaded my classes. Um, That was a really bad place for me to be. And so I'm LDS, served a mission for the LDS church in Korea. And I spent two years happy to be on another continent from chemistry, right? Um, And those two years gave me a lot of clarity. It was like, what do I I actually miss? And what I missed was the sitting down every evening and, and working on my stories. Um, and so when I came back, I said, I'm going to do this. It might be stupid, but I'm young enough to be stupid, right? I'm going to change to English, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write books. Um, and from then on, I wrote uh, two books a year, every year, for the next, uh, the next you know, what, seven years. Um, and I got a job working a graveyard shift at a hotel, and I wrote overnight. I would go to work and check everybody into the hotel. It was a small hotel next to BYU. If you know anything about that, you can know that after about 9 o'clock, it was really quiet. Um, um, not a lot of nightlife in Provo, Utah. I'll just, I'll, I'll just tell you that. If you're looking for a place, then... Um, but, you know, fantastic jello. Um, <laughs> um, but, yeah, so I would go to work and 10 o'clock check everyone in that needed to, 10 to 11, run the audit, which is to check everything. And by midnight, I was done with basically all the work I needed to do for the hotel. And I wrote from midnight to 6 a.m., where I went then and put out the breakfast thing, checked out any people who were early checkouts, and left at 7. So I did three hours of work, and, or two or whatever, and then I wrote for six hours a night, every night. Um, and that's how I did it. And that's, so I was always working on multiple projects, meaning I always had the next one planned, the one I was working on, and then the one I was revising. Um, and that just became my process. And that's why I still get up at noon, because I go to bed at 4, because I write at night, because people leave me alone then. <laughs> go ahead. Okay. So, uh, this part is obviously a trilogy that is, is full of a lot of interesting twists. Uh, and I find that some of the more interesting ones are the ones that come from it seems like you have played off what the reader is expecting to happen based on writing. The, the, the hero of ages is around that in the example. Uh, and that's kind of what I use when I'm trying to get people into writing. I, I pitch them that book and say, hey, this is different than everything, anything you'll ever read. And the fact that you've fallen out of reading is going to make it better. I just wanted to know if that was intentional or uh, if that's what you set up to do. Right. That was intentional for Mistborn. Uh, Mistborn was intentionally a modernist take. Um, if you know anything about uh, uh, literary theory on the epic fantasy genre. I'd read it since I was a kid. I loved it. I was um, Then, if you, you know anything about epic fantasy, the late 90s were a hard time for epic fantasy. The genre felt like it got very stale. We lost a lot of readers. I was just a reader then. I was, not, um, ri- I was writing, but I wasn't published and things. And so I was part of all of this. And it felt like after Robert Jordan's success... Um, followed by um, what happened is uh, Terry Goodkind got very popular. And there's a very interesting story there in that um, Goodkind was the first kind of, um, I don't want to say manufactured, that makes it sound bad, um, but kind of manufactured number one, meaning fantasy for a long time had been a, a, a stable midless genre, but had not been a dominating the chart genre. Robert Jordan came along and started dominating the charts. And suddenly a lot of things started doing very well. And so Goodkind's Wizard's First Rule was the first one where publishers were actively seeking a fantasy bestseller top of the list book and it went to b- big auction because of that all everyone wanted it and then they um they they spent a ton of money promoting it when tor got it and slotted it into a slot um where normally a robert jordan book went because he'd been once a year every year and then he went to one every two years and they slipped good kind into that and just knocked it out of the park that book sold gangbusters everybody loved it um launched terry good kind into this um, big internet 
international phenomenon. And so then everybody thought they could do that with fantasy. And um, epic fantasy in the late 90s, you saw a whole string of, of good kind and Jordan clones get released onto the market with huge marketing pushes, and they basically all flopped hardcore. Um, the biggest example of this is one called The Fifth Sorceress. You can go read up on it um, if you're interested in the background of epic fantasy. Like, and it was just they all lost their shirts on these big releases that they paid huge advances for that didn't go anywhere. Um, and Ep- Epic Fantasy and a lot of the readers were like, this is all the same stuff. It's all bland. Um, you know, we loved Robert Jordan, but give us something different. And they all jumped ship and started reading YA, where Harry Potter and Garth Nix uh, and some of these people, um, uh, some of these books were coming out that were just fantastic. If you haven't read Sabriel, it's amazing. Um, and that, it was that era, and that was where YA um, fantasy was really doing a bunch of dynamic and interesting things. And the genre, we just lost everybody. Um, half of them went to urban fantasy. Half of them went to, um, to, um, to YA and middle grade and it left kind of this wasteland in epic fantasy. And when I was writing, and this is when um, um, my generation was all kind of responding to that, and you see Mistborn, you see the professor in me coming out now, was me saying, hey, I love all these fantasy tropes, but they've been done to death. Can I play off of that and write a book series that's like, yes, I'm in the know, you're in the know, let's have fun with the fact that epic fantasy um, got stale for a while and things like that. Um, so that it was very intentional. All right, I've got to do my reading now. Um, this is going to be the reading um, from Stormlight 3. Um, so this will spoil Stormlight 2. So I'll let the rest of you clap and say, thank you, Brandon, and yada, yada, yada. And then you should leave. <laughs> okay, yes, I'm going to pull this up. This is going to be a reading from Stormlight 3. Um, so, yeah. This is not the same one that I posted on tour, by the way. I love you, Brandon. Oh, thank you very much. I love you, too. (laughs) Thank you for reading my books. I get to be this, whatever I am, because you guys read my books, so thank you. Okay, there we are. So, um, and I won't start reading through the door closed, so don't worry, those are leaving. Oh, get your book, yes. Mm Mm-hmm. So... This is really rough, okay? This is probably not chapter one of the book. In fact, I know it's not, and it's not the prologue. But it is the first chapter from a certain character um, that I felt... You know, I had a few minutes between doing other things where I'm like, I need to... I want to get this down. I want to write this. So, all right. Can we close that door? Oh, one more person's taken off. So, I apologize for the, um, the uh, roughness of this. Paladin trudged through a field of quiet rock rock buds, fully aware that he was too late to prevent the disaster. The knowledge slowed him, pressing against his shoulders with an almost physical sensation, like the weight of a bridge he was forced to carry all on his own. The land around him should have felt familiar. Instead, it seemed wild and overgrown, almost alien. After so long in the stormlands, those eastern lands which bore the brunt, brunt of the storms, he had almost forgotten the sights of a more fertile landscape. Rock buds grow almost as big as barrels here, with vines as thick as his wrist spilling out and lapping water from the pools on the stone. Grass spread in fields that came up to his waist, dappled with glowing life spread. The grass was a vibrant green and slow to pull down into its burrows as he approached. Kaladin shook his head. The grass back near the shattered plains had barely grown as high as his ankle, and had almost come in, and had mostly come in yellowish patches on the leeward side of hills. Almost anything could be hiding in these fields. All you'd have to do was crouch down and wait for the grass to sneak back up around you, and you'd have a perfect ambush point. How would he never notice that during his youth? He'd run through fields like this, playing catch-me with his brother, trying to see who was quick enough to grab handfuls of grass before it hid. Something caught his eye, and he started toward it, startling the grass around himself in a pocket. Kaladin felt drained, used up, like a mighty storm that had lost its fury and was now just a soft breeze. His dramatic flight westward had begun with more stormlight than he thought he could hold, and a wealth more tucked into his pockets and pack in the form of gemstones. It ended with this, a limping, exhausted trudge through fields. Perhaps he could have flown all the way to northwestern Alethkar from the Shattered Plains if he'd been more practiced with his powers. As it was, despite bearing a king's wealth in gemstones and stormlight, he'd run out somewhere in Aladar's princedom. He'd traveled hundreds of miles in half a day, and still it hadn't been enough. This last bit, not 30 miles to walk, had been excruciating. So slow. 
He would have passed this distance in an eye blink before, but he had been walking now for two days. He felt like a man who had been winning a foot race only to trip and break his legs a handspan from the finish line. He neared the object he'd seen earlier, and the grass obligingly pulled back before him, revealing a broken wooden churn for turning sow's milk into butter. Caledon rested fingers on the splintered wood. Only the wealthy had access to enough milk for this sort of thing, and a churn would have been locked up tight before a storm. He glanced to the side at another chunk of of wood peeking out over the tops of the grass, like the hand of a drowning man reaching toward the sky. Sills zipped down as a ribbon of light, passing his head and spinning around the lengths of wood. He could sense an inquisitiveness to her motions, even though she hadn't manifest her face yet. Was he mistaken, or was their bond growing stronger? His ability to read her emotions and his was improving. Or read her emotions and she his. Perhaps it was just familiarity. It's the side of a roof, Caledon said, the lip that hangs down on the leeward side of a building, probably a storage shed, judging by the debris he'd spotted in the field. Alethkar wasn't in the stormlands, but neither was it some soft-skinned, stormless western land. Buildings here were built low and squat, particularly outside of, a big, outside of big sheltered cities. They'd be pointed eastward toward the storms, and windows would only be on the leeward side. Like the grass and the trees, mankind bowed before the storms. The alternative was to be ripped apart, for the Stormfather did not suffer the insolent. But then these objects, ripped free in winds, deposited miles from their origins, had not come free in a high storm. Another, more fell wind had done this deed, a storm that blew the wrong direction. The mere thought of that, at the mere thought of that, a panic rose inside of him, a feeling like he got when watching a hail of arrows fall upon himself and his men. The Everstorm, as it was called, was so wrong, so unnatural, like a baby born with no face. Some things should just not be. And the most troubling part was the storm itself was not the worst of their problems. I will stop right there. So there you you can see, you can maybe compare that to the book when it comes out. You can see, usually I overwrite um, a lot um, at the beginning. I'm trying to get everything in there that I think might need to be in there. And then through trimming, I usually cut about 20%. So that'll be a lot leaner when you eventually see it um, and hopefully a little bit more active. But I'm just kind of trying to get down the emotional resonance of the character and the feeling of what's going on as we go forward. Um, so there you go. That um, is Stones Unhollowed, which is about a year and a half away or maybe more. Sorry. Ah, thank you guys.